This morning I'm sitting with Mark Thornton, professor of economics. Actually, you're teaching at Auburn a little bit uh, now, right? Is That's right. Yeah. Uh, just finished up a stint at Auburn, <laughs> teaching the uh, economics, economic history of the U.S. And uh, it was a last-minute f- uh, fill-in position, but it was really a great time. Um, got a chance to use Murray Rothbard's History of Money and Banking uh, and Bob Higgs' book, Crisis and Leviathan. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was a unique course, yeah. no doubt. Uh, now, uh, you may be the first person to have used this uh, Rothbard history of money banking in the U.S. in a classroom setting, since it's, it's a fairly new book. It's fairly new, but uh, actually I ha- only had like four days to pick my textbooks. <laughs> and um, so I was planning on using something from the Institute's collection. Uh, but I went online and... There's actually a handful of professors who teach the same course around the country who are already using uh, Rothbard's History of Money and Banking uh-huh. as a supplemental text, mm-hmm. you know, not as the main text, but as right. a supplemental text. So but I was happy to see that. It's interesting how that book came together because, um, you know, people wonder, well, let's see, uh, Rothbard died uh, 12 years ago. They keep the new books coming out. <laughs> how does this happen? But, uh, but Murray had written a series of... Um, Essays on uh, on American uh, monetary history that appeared in, in unusual places, right? Yeah, they um, were all, as I understand it, all separate projects at separate points in time. I mean, yeah. it wasn't something he sat down and consciously organized and uh, produced uh, sequentially. Um, they were different projects um, completed at different points in his career, and. Um, is only on you know reflecting on the papers that you could see here's a consistent um, set of essays that really cover all of the important points mm-hmm. of the history of money and banking up until the modern era and it it starts uh, from the very beginning mm-hmm. and uh, it goes up through and past World War two and uh, you know so you have the modern system in place and it does a very good job of basically showing you how we've got from uh, a laissez-faire system um, and why we chose a laissez-faire system because of all the problems of the colonial days and the, uh, the British mercantilist policies and, uh, and you know we got we ended up with a good system um, with the uh, the laissez-faire Democrats really almost completing the um, uh, what you know would otherwise be an Austrian revolution in money and banking uh, in the 1840s, and then, of course, the Civil War st- starts us going downhill towards paper money, government control, uh, eventually fiat money and central banking. Yeah. It's 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 remarkable when you th- when you look back at uh, that election of 1800 and how critically everything sort of turned on on which party would ultimately control the central state. What a tragedy, huh? Yeah. I mean, it was a wonderful thing that Jefferson won, but how, how close did it come to having the, the inflationist mercantilists just completely drive the country into the ground much sooner than <laughs> they did Well, later. yeah. I mean, uh, Murray, Murray always pointed out how the, um, the Whiskey re- uh, Rebellion was so important and so indicative of the times. You know, the, the Federalists were c- sort of in control of things, um, you know, putting the alcohol tax on, organizing this giant um, army, and so on and so forth. And uh, the American people were very ticked off at all that, of course. And uh, the election of 1800 was a was an absolute rout of the Federalists and the Nationalists yeah. uh, in favor of the Anti-Federalists. And, and the major indication of that is that their candidates came in in first and second place, tied uh, mm-hmm. between Jefferson and Burr. And right. it was, you know, basically a, a coin flip to decide uh, who was actually going to be president. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Jefferson did some really good things in terms of eliminating taxes and uh, eliminating debt and, and getting rid of government and minimizing the military. But then, of course, uh, some bad things as well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that whole land purchase thing was a yeah <laughs> was a problem, wasn't it? Well, yeah. he he had a theory of, you know, that we had all this wilderness out there, and that, you know, what we needed is the the government to go in there and you know post some 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 soldiers and then sell the land so that the land ended up in the hands of individual people. Mm-hmm. 
uh, individual colonists rather than in the hands of a government or a foreign government, which right. was he was most worried about. And, you know, that's not a perfect system, but it, it, it beats what happened later on when the federal government just sort of, you know, took massive areas of the western United States and, and controls it to this day. Yeah. You know, so it's... Uh, you can kind of make a case for his thinking at the time. Well, it doesn't seem like he later regretted it. I mean, those late letters where he says... You know, this country should really be broken up into lots of different towns, smaller countries. It should. <laughs> yeah. It still should. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's sort of charming. You know, I, I think it would be great if we had, um, uh, you know, uh, an East Coast, uh, 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 Louisiana, yeah. uh, Great Lake states, uh, California, the mountain states, whatever, uh, Microsoft in the Northwest. <laughs> um, Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, uh, and... You know, and if the French hadn't been such lousy colonizers and such, you know, stupid inflationists, they m- they might have ended up with North America. Mm-hmm. We've all, we we might be speaking French right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, and then, of course, it, it, it's also alarming to Americans who take for granted free speech uh, to look back at the Alien and Sedition Acts of the the, the late 18th uh, century and uh, to just see how quickly the government. You know, wants to control what we think and what we say and what, what we do. Especially yes, especially when it's when it's critical of them. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's they were just protecting themselves. They weren't actually protecting other citizens against other citizens, which right. is supposedly what their job is about. But that was one of the fun things about teaching this course is that my mind was so open, having never taught it, actually having never taken the course before in in the economic history of the U.S., is that my mind was receptive i think to connections especially connections with what's currently going on mm-hmm. and so you know it's it's not a stretch to uh link the alien and sedition acts to various components of the patriot act you know That's things like sure. that yeah. um and uh or and well also later on in the course um uh we were in the 1920s and um I had just visited New Orleans. Um, it, of course, Katrina had gone through there and destroyed most of the city. And um, I had just gone there for a visit and come back. And I was lecturing the next day. And I realized, you know, the Katrina, Katrina thing was so much similar to the Great Flood of 1927. So I went in there and started lecturing about the Great Flood of 1927, where basically everything, the same thing happened. I mean, a, a natural disaster was in the works. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers basically blew it, um, and their their system of protection failed, um, and ended up flooding uh, tons of people, um, basically poor people, uh, mostly black people in both cases, of course, and um, promised uh, that they would be receive help, um, and uh, that you know compensation never materialized. Um, Hoover actually was uh, the Secretary of Commerce at the time uh, promising the black people of the Mississippi Delta that he would help them if he was elected president. Of course, he he uh, broke that promise, and that's one of the main reasons why the African-American community moved over from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And, of course, this is all things that students had never heard of before. Yeah, isn't that something? It's yeah. almost like you're reading about another planet or something. Right. Well, <laughs> and, and this is this is real... Uh, economic history, and I wouldn't have been exposed to it if I hadn't been exposed to the Austrian school and Bob Higgs and Murray Rothbard and and a lot of the others. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I was, and I was fortunate to to uh, read a book about the flood of 1927 a few years ago, and I did that article um, in the Free Market Newsletter about the Great Flood. Yeah, long before Katrina. Oh yeah, and many so years. When, yeah, sometimes. You know, that whole Katrina thing was just such a catastrophe. It was just um, amazing. And yet it was clear to anybody who knew the history or the uh, the, uh, the circumstances behind it that it wasn't uh, Mother Nature uh, uh, really at work there. I mean, except, except, uh, except as a precipitating event. But that it was a failure of uh, the inf- infrastructure and a failure that's so deeply rooted in uh, the history of policy uh, it was managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah, the Army Corps of Engineers is really just one disaster after another. 
they they fix the situation afterwards, fixing the previous disaster, but never preparing for the next one. Um, and all of their infrastructure is is just fine as long as nothing happens. Uh, the problem is is that it's supposed to be there because something might happen. Anything unusual happens. Uh, whoops! It's just it's kind of oh yeah yeah. yeah. We, we all of our backup systems failed simultaneously. Yeah. Who knew that you know in a storm the power might go out and so therefore the pumps might not work and therefore <laughs> you know it's going to undermine the dikes and they're going to break and you know and I was down in New Orleans, um, y- you know, seventeenth uh, and eighteenth century uh, New Orleans is just fine. I mean it's all there, it's all clean and perfect and rebuilt and uh, but as the closer you go to the present, particularly. Um, in the 20th century, in the post World War II period, where government was building lots of uh, housing and you know for the poor people and stuff like that, all of that is a, is a total disaster, completely unfixable. Isn't that so revealing, isn't it? Just by looking at where the damage is, you find out you can you can actually trace out a chronology of the policy. Yeah, the original city, um, the original commercial city, is is basically just fine, but. All of the government um, areas where they, ex- you know, expended resources on our behalf, uh, luring poor people into very dangerous situations, basically, uh, putting their housing um, in floodplains. Um, it's really, you know, when you reflect on it, it's almost criminal. Mm-hmm. The way they, the way they went about things, and subsidizing it with uh, with all the subs- government subsidies for for insurance. Oh, oh yeah, flood, yeah. Flood insurance. But, yeah, we went into all that about um, how the the government insurance um, has has basically lured people into dangerous zones, and you know I showed pictures uh, to some of my students about uh, houses in Louisiana before government programs, and they're all built up on stilts. You know, they're all twelve feet off the ground, yeah. and then you see. Um, houses after the insurance programs go in effect and they're built on slabs right yeah. on the ground yeah. and so naturally whenever it floods all of those houses are destroyed and all the ones up on stilts um, are perfectly fine and dry out within a matter of days. You know, you could make a general point, can't you, about, about observing some of these issues among uh, a, a thousand more. That the, the market has a way of kind of training people to make responsible decisions. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about it. I mean, um, you know, the market with insurance companies or, for example, getting a bank loan to, to build a business or to build a house, the bank is not going to lend money on an asset that's in, that's in harm's way. Uh, so it's not going to give you the loan. Insurance companies aren't going to back up uh, projects like that, whether they're commercial or residential or whatever, um, unless they're in a reasonably safe uh, environment. So is, it doesn't matter how dumb you are. Um, if you're in the market economy, you're going to get feedback um, of a nature which go- is going to help protect you, yeah. whether you like it or not. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting how often uh, market signals cause us to do things that otherwise we uh, wouldn't think to do or might not even want to do, really. Um, uh, for example, um, I know many people who have uh, who have quit smoking just so they could drive down their insurance premiums, their life insurance premiums, for example. Now that that's a very interesting case. All the government programs in the world can't get can't seem to get people to to stop smoking. I mean, not even high taxes on cigarettes, but but insurers come along and say, look, if we detect some nicotine in your blood, uh, you're going to have to pay an extra two hundred fifty dollars a month for insurance. And then people have to decide, was it worth it? Yeah, I mean, they still have free choice. Sure. But uh, uh, you have to assess the trade-offs. Yeah, the the marketplace. You know, the more you look at it, the more you inspect it, um, and dig dig down into it, you realize that it it, it has all of these feedback mechanisms yeah. that tell you, um, you know, and just getting jobs, holding jobs, uh, getting advances in, in employment, all that stuff. Um, paying your bills, credit. Pay, you're paying your bills. Yeah, I mean, you've got to maintain your health uh, to a certain level so that you can show up for work in order that you get promotions. I mean, people who don't maintain their health um, and don't show up for work on time and aren't productive, you know, they don't go anywhere. And so uh, there's there's always these feedback mechanisms, most of which are not really articulated for us. Mm -hmm. They're just, um, they're unarticulated 
uh, feedback mechanisms, and you know we need to uh, point these out. Um, I also did a an article a little while back about the uh, the effect of uh, the business cycle, um, the government's, the Federal Reserve's business cycle, and how it affects our behavior. And uh, it, it it basically showed that when the Fed creates an in inflationary boom in the economy, people become more irresponsible. They learn bad lessons. They take up bad habits. And so during the, those inflationary booms where everything is great and wonderful and everybody's making money and has a job, people pick up smoking, they gain weight, they dress poorer, you know, all these negative things. And so... Save less. Save less, of course. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing we do know. But there's all these other yeah. socially undesirable things. They stop um, buying Renaissance polyphony and start buying rock and roll CDs? Or <laughs> <laughs> no. Turn to rap. I don't know. <laughs> what is with these people? <laughs> and, you know, and then when the, when the bus comes, then everybody sort of straightens up. They cut their hair. They stop smoking. They lose a little weight. They try to look a little better and, you know, act a little better and uh, uh, try to have the edge up at, at work and stuff like that because the normal constraints have returned. Yeah. You know, so... Um, it just seems like everything the government does is not only bad, but is much worse than we ever thought it was. Yeah. You know, things are much worse because we don't really know all of the negative things that the government does, all the ramifications. And, and likewise, as we pointed out, uh, we don't know all the positive ramifications of what the market is doing for us. Yeah, this is really, I mean, you really speak to what I always think of as a kind of a mark of your of your uh, lifetime uh, contribution to, to economics. You have this this uh, particular kind of turn of mind where you're very curious about about odd uh, sectors of society and uh, you, you seek out explana explanations of them in, uh, in a very creative way, you know. And well, thank you. Yeah, well, having worked with you for, for so many years, you're always surprising. Uh, me and everybody else with uh, some some new insight. That well, you know, Austrian economics provides you with a framework um, that you know that there's an answer there, right? Yeah. And so the whole thing is just to be able to sit still long enough and to think about something long enough and dig around, you know, looking at um, various forms of evidence until the story makes sense, mm -hmm. and then and then you run with it and, and start digging for the details and. And building the case and building the story, and because you know that's 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 the great thing about Austrian economics is that it gives you that framework where you you know where to look basically, um, and you know and eventually you'll find the answer if you look long enough and hard enough. Uh, you'll 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 be able to make the case uh, for something that makes sense to solve those little puzzles, those little curiosities, and. Um, you know, I've been uh, digging around with Richard Cantillon and his economics and and the puzzles about his work, um, most of which are sort of put forth um, in Rothbard's History of Economics. Um, you know, and I so I've just been sitting there digging and, uh, you know, through the evidence and, and, and going out in a thousand different directions until um, you find the truth. Yeah. And your work on Cantillon is at what stage? Well, the uh, the r research into his economics is um, is pretty complete, um, and and most of these are, uh, of course, are are hints that were in Rothbard's History of Economics. But one of them, the first one, is besides just a general description of his work and his contributions, um, the fact that he was the inventor or discoverer of opportunity costs, which is the foundation of economics. Uh, that's been accepted for publication and will be coming out next year. Um, one that really took a little while was um, trying to prove that David Hume got his economics from reading the manuscript of Cantillon uh, has also been accepted for publication, amazingly. Um, but basically, you know, Hume is credited with putting forth the first economic theories um, very similar to Cantillon's. Well, basically I showed that even though Cantillon was killed long before Hume uh, wrote e economics and his uh, book wasn't published until after 
Hume published his theories, I basically showed that they basically knew the same people and that they, that in all likelihood, Hume had access to a copy of it. And so that's been accepted for publication. I'm, I've also got a paper showing that that Cantillon was not a mercantilist. I mean, every, all these things, you know, they, they think that Cantillon had this crazy theory of value, and I showed that, no, it's really opportunity cost, and and uh, that Hume was really the first originator of economics, and no, I've shown that Cantillon was, and, and this thing that about Cantillon being a mercantilist never made any sense yeah. to, to Rothbard, myself, and a lot of other people. And, and basically, I've been able to show that he wasn't a mercantilist, that it's a com- uh, misreading of, of history. I mean, that, that all these historians of thought uh, read the book completely out of historical context. And so by adding the history to the history of economics, it just completely changes the direction of the, uh, of the narrative. Um, and also the latest project uh, which I've written up and uh, I think it's on the working paper site is uh, the mystery of Adam Smith's invisible hand and uh, basically there's been about a dozen articles published in the last 10 years in all the mainstream journals that have come up with new interpretations of Adam Smith's invisible hand pointing, uh, painting him as some kind of modern general welfare theorist and um, that didn't make any sense to me. It, and it doesn't make any sense to um, other historians of thought that I've talked to. And what I did was I started looking back at Smith's invisible hand. He's got two different uses of the invisible hand. And what, I was, what I've been able to show is that both of those uses of the invisible hand come from a chapter in Cantillon's essay. Uh, one talks about the the... The landlord and and how you know the landlord's so well off, but actually everybody gets food, clothing, and shelter. So that's kind of like an invisible hand explanation. And the other is about um, how consumers are satisfied through self-interest of the entrepreneurs. All of that is in the same chapter of Cantillon, and we know that Smith read Cantillon because he mentions Cantillon in the Wealth of Nations. So I think all four of those essays. Um, really repaint the history of the founding of economics, which is it, it's not really Hume wrote some essays, influenced his friend Smith, and Smith went on to create classical economics. It was Cantillon wrote an essay that influenced David Hume, Adam Smith, the physiocrats, Turgot, uh, Condillac, and so on and so forth, um, right down to the modern Austrian school Menger, Mises, Hayek. Does Cantillon provide a link between the classical school and the late scholastics? Uh, well, you know, I would say um, Cantillon was uh, schooled in a scholastic tradition and uh, was very well versed in uh, just a tremendous literature, Greek, Roman, yeah. uh, scholastics. So in fact, he, he actually he actually criticizes some of the scholastics um, in the, in his essay. Um, he uses them as in defense of his attack on usury, uh, but he he says, you know, these guys really didn't know what it was like to be a banker. Like he was a banker. <laughs> yeah, he was a banker. Have you found a picture of him yet? No, no picture. We're still we're still looking for that picture. Um, we have portraits of his wife right. and and the daughter, and we're trying to find somebody to do some kind of computer graphics where they extract his genetics. Yeah, on the th- and how long were they married? Yeah, some people say that the, the people are married long enough they start to look similar, so you could kind of. <laughs> uh, they weren't. They actually weren't married that long, and uh. and um, one of the theories I'm working on, uh, of course, Cantillon was said to have been murdered. 1734, and then Anton Murphy, uh, in his great uh, biography of Cantillon, puts forward the theory that he wasn't murdered, but he faked his own death, <laughs> uh, which is intriguing and possible. Um, if you put it in historical context, um, England was in a crisis, political crisis. Um, Cantillon was backing the opponents of the regime, uh, so anything could have happened. But I'm getting very suspicious of the British that um, they may have had uh, Cantillon assassinated because uh, he was backing the opposition. Uh, he had a lot of money, and his friend was Bolingbroke. They lived right next to each other. And um, 
uh, apparently there's there's some rumors in the Murphy book about <coughs> Cantillon and his wife not getting along, and uh, and that she was becoming involved with a British citizen who was a spy, um, and later on married after Cantillon's quote unquote death, uh, she ended up marrying him. So. Very suspicious of all that. You know, the history of economic thought is just riveting. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you got to love it. I mean, yeah. it, it, it is so, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to get people to sit still long enough to make it interesting. Yeah. But in, in fact, in truth, um, it's, it's very important. Um, you have to know your history, uh, whether it's the history of economic thought or the history of your country, whatever it is, correctly in order to know what the problems are, what the solutions are to what we face in the present. Um, and uh, so that's why I think going back and correcting the origins of economic theory is so important. Yeah. This seems, it seems like there could be endless numbers of, of, of essays that could be done uh, just working off some of the seeds planted in uh, the Rothbard History of Economic Thought, which is... Um, now, of course, it was a famous book when it was after it was published, and it was published, I think, just about. Was it published maybe a couple of months after his death? Right. Yeah. Um, and it was it was a big deal even uh, for the last uh, ten years. But then when we came out with a new edition, which was just a fraction of the price. Um, but there's so much in there. I've I've had the sense that there's, I mean, just on the British banking debates alone, there's so much information. It's overwhelming. It is, and and you really. Um Everyone needs to read the whole thing, but then there's um, the case to be made for reading small sections of it, maybe a chapter or maybe even a section, and thinking about, you know, contemplating what's what's going on there. What is Rothbard uh, telling us, and what um, is he leading us to? Because he's, he's, in reality, he's just chock full of ideas. Every everywhere, everything that he wrote is not just informative, but it's it's pointing you. Uh, in the direction for further research, yeah, to do more work on it, and, and like for example, Roderick Long has uh, already, you know, kind of written a few essays dealing with uh, Rothbard's section on China, for, for example. Yeah. Among other things. Yeah, it's uh, it, there's it's just endless, um, endless possibilities, and and one of the things that um, among other people, Murray uh, suggested that you know that the Cantillon essay. Needed to be retranslated. That it well, there was. It was just a. It was just not a good translation. Yeah, we carry the 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 only translation that's that's in print currently. Y- yeah, English, right? the, the Brewer edition. Yeah, and, and that's basically th- the same thing as the 1931 Higgs translation. It's yeah. just a redo um, of that. And it's you know that's fine. But Murray was right. I mean, there's just all sorts of problems, and there's no way the modern American can read that and understand the book. Yeah, and so. We're working on this new translation. It's just you know, a uh, matter of funding and, and time and. Uh, it's just it's the whole translation business is just overwhelming. I mean, it really is just. It really is. Uh, I had no idea how difficult it would be to retranslate a book that's already been translated. I thought, well, you know, this would be a no-brainer. But um, I'm working with a, uh, a professional translator. Um, Chantal Saucier, and you know she's got her PhD in French and you know all this stuff, and and uh, but we'll we'll spend you know days sometimes on trying to do a paragraph or a sentence. Yeah, you can't buy this. You can't buy in the marketplace this level of care. Uh, uh, it, I mean, it's it's, you've got to be a fanatic. I, mean, I think, for example, you know, Guido always says that Menger. No, it wasn't Guido because I, I asked Guido about this the other day whether or not Menger's principles needed to be re-translated. And you know what he said. He said, I don't know, I've never read the English. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've only read the German. Yeah, but and Guido's, Guido's helped us, you know, at several points uh, because he he knows, uh, of course, English and German yeah. and, and French. Right. Um, and the interesting, another interesting thing is that Higgs translated Cantillon's essay in 1931 into English. Hayek and his wife translated Cantillon's essay in 1931 into German. Now, what's going on there? I mean, the the book is written in 1730. It's not published until 1755, and then it sits around 
for a zillion years, and, to, and then it's published into two different languages in 1931. Yeah. And uh, that's another just curiosity. I mean, I'm not sure if there's anything to that, but I'd, I'd like to know, yeah. you know, why is it the case um, that both of those things were accomplished in the same year yeah. um, after such a tremendously long period of time uh, before it originally appeared? This is when Hayek was still living in... Was he, in, he wasn't in... No, had, had he left for Britain by that time? He was. Uh, he was. Um, well, he must have. They must have done the translation in Austria. Right. But um, I think that they were in England when it came out. Yeah. It was that kind of uh, time frame. Those were remarkable years for the Austrian school. So much productivity. So much. And then it all, of course, came to an end. Yeah. It, the. Um, you know, Mises brought it together, built it up, brought it together, um, and got the ball rolling, so to speak. And then, of course, Hitler and World War II just scattered and smashed the whole thing. Uh, we were lucky uh, to be able to save some of it. Yeah. You know, I suppose that it, 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 enough of it was saved with uh, Hayek and Machlip and uh, Mises coming to the United States. Um, yeah, then reborn again. You know, eventually, so, you know, yeah. it was like a dormant seed almost. Right. Mises was, you know, sort of keeping it going, and um, it's miraculous, I think, that it survived in and some it's, sense. Isn't it remarkable too to be here at this conference and see these just uh, mobs you know, of, of students that are just uh, learning so much? Yeah, it's a it's a great group, uh, just tremendous uh, students and. Uh, you know, they just wear you out with questions yeah. at, at, at lunch um, and, and breakfast and dinner. Um, it's, it's, you know, you can listen to all this stuff and hear all the archive stuff uh, for these conferences, but you're getting really a small fraction of the program. I mean, it's great, and it's, it's almost like an advertisement, but you get so much more when you come here, and you actually uh, you can just sit there and watch other people Talking, discussing, and interacting, but it's it's available, um, and it's it's wonderful, you know. And they get so much out of it. And the thing I like now is these students who come, you know, and they say, "Oh, you know, uh, we're never going to get anywhere with this stuff. You know, we're such a small group, and you know, we're so marginalized." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> you have marginalized. No, is. You have no idea. So I just, you know. Rewind the tape 25 years yeah. when I started, and when the Mises Institute started as as a small office with an electric typewriter, no computers, no you know mailing machines, no no nothing. Basically, we had nothing. There was no books. There was no newsletters. There was no. It was Zilcho, and there was like six Austrian economists who were still alive and not retired, and actually teaching and writing in the world. You know that, you know there were no no Austrians at all active in Europe, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I can remember the early early the mid nineteen eighties. People saying to me, Jeff, why don't you just why don't you get a real job? Instead <laughs> of around these, you know, little, this, this tiny group of of, uh, of uh, ideological fanatics. Yeah. Uh, you know, work for now. Of course, people say, Wow, what a great job! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another question I get: is how do you get a job like this? <laughs> I said, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea how you can get a job like this. Um, uh, but it is, you know, it's it's a, it's a great, uh, it's it's great what has actually happened. Another thing that um, every Mises University, um, I always remember this and relate it to some of the students. Um, you know, in the early years, the Mises University was was kind of small. And then it started getting going, and we were like at Stanford University, you know, the big time, and hundred people would come, and we'd have you know great faculty, and and by the end of the week, some of us would start thinking, you know, this is really great. I wonder how many years we could do this before everybody in the world who would like to come to the Mises yeah. University has already been here. Yeah, you know, we always if this is always our, our I don't know if you call it a failing, but for years we underestimated our the extent of the market, don't you think? I mean, well, it's, I think it's, it's just changed. I mean, I think the the market continues to grow. Yeah. And and, and you know, we th we just thought of it as 
is a stagnant set of people out there in the world who would come to the Mises University once, maybe twice, so you get all of the courses yeah. that were offered. Because, of course, you couldn't hear them archived on the Internet back then. Mm -hmm. There wasn't an Internet back then. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so we just assumed that there's, you know, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people in the world who would want to come to this. And then after that, we would have to come up with some kind of new program. But the reality is, is that um, the number of people who want to come new each year expands right. and we're getting you know students of students uh, sons and daughters of members you know all that stuff is starting to really uh, expand the pie so to speak you know who had a really strong sense of this long before I understood uh, by this I mean uh, th how much hope we can we can put in the fact that there's always a new generation of thinkers you know a new new group was Murray. He always had this kind of real long-term view mm -hmm. uh, towards education, and uh, I remember being on the phone with him and uh, you know puzzling about you know, some some young professor somewhere having written some crazy thing or whatever. And he'd always just say, "Jeff, don't, you know, just don't worry about it. I mean, there's you know the next generation, the next generation, the generation after that. We'll, we'll get it right." And I remember thinking at the time, you know, he doesn't, he's not, um, he's not. Uh, uh, He's not alarmed enough about the errors of the of the of the of the, of the current current generation, but in fact he saw something I couldn't I couldn't have seen at the time, which is that is that you know time always marches forward and there's new people and, and mm -hmm. new ideas and and uh, that's that's a wonderful thing. He he often wrote about the youth and how much hope you can put in into uh, this constant this relentless change that's associated with the fact that there's always a new generation to teach. Absolutely. Um, Murray always said, and I'll always remember, he said, in the short run, I'm always pessimistic. In the long run, <laughs> yeah, I'm always optimistic. Yeah. And once you adopt that and really grind that into your sensibilities, uh, life is a lot easier, yeah, basically, <laughs> and, and a lot more fun. And, uh, you know, uh, the the lesson of youth is, is so very important. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's it's institutionalized in the Mises University. I mean, there's a lot of our members and older people who would like to come to the Mises University, but we just don't, you know, emphasize that. We have separate programs for them. This is a program for young people and college students, uh, the future. Yeah. And so there are, you know, zero slots for for older people, basically. Yeah, we yeah. want to convert the youth. They're They're more open-minded. They live longer. Uh, they've got, you know, there's there's a lot of potential yeah. there, and you know, everybody has to realize that that um, you you uh, it's much better to try to convert your friend, your classmate, uh, than it is to try to convert your grandfather, your grandmother. Uh, first of all, they have their own views that have been around a long time. They're not likely to change them. And uh, they're not going to be live as long and, and have as much influence as your friends and your classmates and your coworkers who um, are young and vigorous and have a lot to prove. And if you give them something exciting like liberty to work for, um, they'll be just that much more energetic and that much more um, helpful to the whole movement. Well, next time somebody asks. How do you uh, how does how does he get a job like you have? Um, wh the one thing I can observe about about you and your your work is that uh, well there are many things I can observe, but uh, one is that you're a very hard worker, a very creative thinker, um, but also you're a generous scholar. You're always giving of yourself and your ideas mm -hmm. for something uh, something big and something important, and you've done this relentlessly for. For a very long time, and produced some some wonderful work that's going to continue to serve the Austrian School for many generations in the future. So, I want to say thank you to you for, for that, and thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.